else, uh, at a licensed clinical right. uh, psychologist with a programmatic line of research um, centering on the use of technology for eating disorder prevention and treatment with screening, sociocultural, etiological, and maintenance factors for eating disorders, as well as recovery um, and college mental health. Um, you have a wonderful bio and is just an amazing colleague to, to partner with. Um, uh, and so I want, you know, your work to, to showcase, but just to, to throw out there, she's been collaborating with um, numerous industry partners, nonprofit organizations, including the National Eating Disorder Association and the National Association for Anorexia Nervosa and Associated Disorders, or ANAD, as well as statewide groups across the U.S. Um, to, to pursue her work. So with that, take it away, Ellen. Also, I should mention right. um, that we are co-sponsored with the Society of Digital Mental Health. We're thrilled to have um, you know that opportunity and looking forward to your presentation, Ellen. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for that really lovely Oops, and why does it say pause? I'm gonna say yes. Um, let me, sorry about that. Let me try one more time and hopefully it'll work this time because I know we practiced before. Looks great. There we go. Looks good. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for that nice um, introduction, uh, Andrea, and for the opportunity, uh, Andrea and uh, David and everyone. Um, really looking forward to, to sharing some information about our work. Um, and the title of the, the talk that I gave today was um, Leveraging Multi-Sector Partnerships to Increase Reach and Impact of Digital Mental Health Interventions. Um, and, you know, just also want to acknowledge that I'm looking forward to sharing and hearing your questions and comments about, you know, some of the lessons that I've learned um, in this area, including loads in the past year, as you'll you'll hear more about um, in this um, talk today. Um, I do have the following commercial relationships um, to disclose, but um, they're not relevant to the material I'll be presenting today. So um, to kick us off, I think it's important to keep in mind that we can use technology to improve or increase access um, to many factors in the pipeline of individuals getting access to evidence-based care. So this could include um, increasing access to screening and identification of mental health problems, um, prevention, treatment, and also better linking individuals with care um, following that screening and identification. And um, in our work, I think we've, we've shown and been able to harness these unique partnerships to really ultimately increase scale and access at, at all of these steps. Um, and today I'll be focusing most um, on my work as it relates to eating disorders, but I think a lot of the the lessons learned and kind of tenants behind our work certainly apply to many other areas of mental health and uh, would be things I'd be um, certainly excited to do more of myself, though it's always a matter of, of time. So most of my work has focused um, specifically on eating disorders. And in terms of why those are important, um, for those who may be less familiar, um, up to 10% of the population will suffer from eating disorder symptoms at some point in their lives. Um, they're also associated with high medical and psychiatric comorbidity, poor quality of life, high mortality, um, and they've skyrocketed in the pandemic and beyond. And numerous reports have found that access to care is, is worse than ever. I'll also give a plug um, to a recent um, paper that I had the honor to co-author, um, led by Annie Hainos and Amy Egbert, and also co-authored um, with some others, including um, Jessica Schleider of, of your center, who, who may be on the call. Um, but this is an editorial we just had the chance to publish in British Journal of Psychiatry, really highlighting um, the fact that we don't think eating disorders are niche, even though they've often been treated in that way and kind of dispelling some of the false assumptions and the problems that have been raised by relegating um, these issues to kind of uh, specialty areas and, and niche pockets. But not the focus of today's talk, but check out that paper if you're interested in learning more. Um, we also know, oops, that there is a wide treatment gap for eating disorders, um, such that less than 20% of individuals with eating disorders ever receive treatment. And even when they do, it's likely not evidence-based. Um, there's also a paradox that exists such that few individuals with an eating disorder receive treatment specifically for that eating disorder, but these individuals are actually more likely to receive treatment and incur higher health services use costs than individuals who don't have an eating disorder. So it's not as though these individuals aren't getting some type of care or presenting to the health setting, they're just not being um, identified or treated specifically for this problem. 
which all of these, you know, kind of gaps um, result in prolonged illness, disease progression, poor prognosis, and greater likelihood of relapse. Um, and so in my work, um, you know, I've really focused on screening and identification as a crucial first step in getting access to care and really trying to move upstream in, um, you know, kind of increasing the improving outcomes for eating disorders. Um, research has shown that, uh, you know, identifying or learning one's symptoms or something in need of help are a really crucial first step in accessing care, particularly given that less than half of individuals with eating disorders recognize they have a problem. Um, in the, the same vein, self-recognition is associated with help seeking, um, perhaps unsurprisingly. And in one study, close to half of participants who recognized they had a problem with their eating had ever sought help versus only one in five who did not recognize a problem had sought help. So really emphasizing the importance again of this early screening and identification. Um, there are, though, many problems in, in current screening and identification for eating disorders in general. This is not, you know, widely offered or available. Even in the case of colleges where eating disorder prevalence is elevated and, and is a group that's at higher risk of these concerns, um, only 22% of colleges offer year-round eating disorder screening opportunities, something like maybe a screener on the Counseling Center website. Um, and even when those are there, of course, those offered screenings only reach a very small number of students. And we also currently don't have any eating disorder screening guidelines. Um, the USPSTF um, did uh, do a report and recommendation on this topic um, a, a year or two back now, um, but found that the current evidence was inconclusive um, to um, recommend um, broad eating disorder screening in primary care settings, not to say that the data suggested that it was harmful, but just that we didn't yet have enough evidence um, to support um, its broad use, um, mostly because of the lack of studies um, in this area and demonstrating the benefit. Um, so more work to be done on that front. We also know that providers miss eating disorders. A majority of individuals who receive treatment for an eating disorder are first seen by their primary care doc, but over 90% of these frontline providers report believing they've missed eating disorder diagnoses. And all of these gaps are really even more pronounced in individuals from minoritized um, backgrounds. For example, individuals from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds are significantly less likely to be diagnosed with an eating disorder or even asked about eating disorder symptoms. So there really is this misconception conception that's been out there, that these are rare problems that only affect um, skinny white affluent girls, when in uh, reality, the research has shown that eating disorders do not discriminate. They affect individuals across all demographic groups. And in fact, some of these um, individuals from minority backgrounds are even more likely to experience eating disorder concerns. So all of these factors, I think, really highlight the importance of readily available eating disorder screening that provides individuals with tailored feedback on their symptoms and concrete suggestions for next steps. And so to meet this need, um, our group um, really pursued uh, this nonprofit partnership. And so what we did, um, led by um, Andrea Graham, um, our group uh, developed an eating disorder screening tool for detecting eating disorder risk and diagnostic symptoms, um, a tool that we refer to as the Stanford Washington University ED uh, screen or SWEED. And what we had the opportunity to do via nonprofit partnerships, including with NIDA and Mental Health America, was to make this screening tool um, readily available um, on the websites of those nonprofit organizations. Um, I'll be focusing most on the work with NIDA since we've we've really um, focused most on that relationship, but uh, and next steps in term that you'll hear more about today. But um, much of this applies to MHA as well. And in fact, their numbers are quite similar. Um, it's really impressive, actually, the reach for eating disorder screening they have. Um, with NIDA, we find that about 200 respondents um, per year complete this screening, which again, as I mentioned, is actually not very dissimilar from what um, MHA finds. And similar to what MHA finds, the vast majority of individuals, um, if they take that eating disorder screener, 
do screen positive for an eating disorder. Um, in the NIDA screen, we found that about 86% screen positive for an eating disorder. And most of those, another 86% have never been in treatment. Those folks are represented by the, the green dots um, on the map here that you see. And only 3% are currently in treatment, represented by um, these very sparse pink dots that you can see um, all across the, the US. And so what typically happens at the end of the NIDA screener and at the end of most um, available um, online mental health screeners is that individuals are given some feedback on their symptoms, you know, maybe given um, some information that their symptoms suggest that they may be at risk for an eating disorder, have one, and then are given a variety of options for what they might do next. Um, some information on available um, resources, online peer support groups, available apps, um, potentially organization helplines if those are available. And what we found is that um, only 16% of those screening positive for an eating disorder and not in treatment initiated care following screen completion. Um, so those were data that we collected among individuals who had taken the need to screen. But this is certainly a gross overestimate given that it's completely reliant on individuals who were willing to complete a follow-up survey. So I would venture to guess in reality the likelihood that individuals actually um, proceed with care following screening is much less than this, you know, um, this is, you know, certainly a guess, but probably somewhere, you know, one to 5%, if that. So, you know, we really thought that we need a novel solution to increase access to care um, that needs to not only identify individuals with eating disorders, but also address prominent barriers that patients um, may face in seeking and receiving timely care, like stereotypes about eating disorders, um, the fact that any, uh, many individuals with eating disorders um, are in denial of illness severity, the fact that many folks may have low motivation for care, that they may not know how to get treatment, and to also better connect individuals with accessible resources, um, given the, the lack of available care available, particularly for kind of a problem that has been relegated as sort of very niche and only treated by um, specialists often. And so our group had the thought that a chatbot could offer a solution to these problems. Um, so a chatbot or a brief um, you know, text-based digital intervention could offer an accessible solution to tackle patient barriers to seeking treatment and also better connect individuals with resources. And before we embarked on this work, you know, there was some um, limited data to show that individuals can respond psychologically to chatbots as if they were people, um, that they had been shown to improve mental health symptoms, including body image and um, some indication of the ability to promote positive health-related behavior change. And other positives of this kind of brief um, uh, inter digital intervention uh, would be that these are very interactive, um, can encourage honest disclosure. Individuals have been shown to, to share things um, rather freely with this kind of anonymous digital tool. It can be used anytime, anywhere, um, and might be especially useful for those who've never spoken with anyone about these concerns before or who have a high level of embarrassment um, or shame. And so we've now taken uh, undertaken two studies in collaboration with our partners at NIDA to develop and evaluate the use of chatbots for two things, which I'll be going over um, more here today as kind of uh, use cases for how we've harnessed these multi-sector partnerships. Um, one, to offer an easily accessible eating disorder prevention program for those at risk, and also two, to increase mental health services use in those with clinical eating disorders. Now, before I, I go further, I want to acknowledge um, some of you may have seen kind of somewhat of a media storm, as I refer to it, that occurred um, this summer. Um, hence my comment at the beginning of the talk about all the lessons I've learned um, in the just the past year. And it's hard to believe this was only, you know, six or so months ago. Much has happened. Um, but there was some, you know, kind of headlines that occurred um, as NIDA made the difficult decision completely independent of, of our work to close their human-led referral helpline, which was designed as a place for people to call up and ask for referrals to treatment. Um, 
and this staff, and again, this is kind of getting into the weeds, had recently unionized. Um, and so there was some kind of misconstrual um, in the media that this chatbot um, that our team had to develop, which I'll tell you more about for eating disorders prevention, was going to replace um, people um, and that it was, you know, kind of this union busting tool to replace humans. And so I hope today I'll dispel some of these these myths, but I just wanted to acknowledge this one line of the the media narrative that was out there this summer, which also highlights, you know, kind of some of the pros and cons of these multi-sector partnerships um, and harnessing them for research and, and ultimate scale. There was a second narrative that was out there, you know, so now we have all this attention. Um, the bot has been portrayed as a a union busting tool that's out here to, to replace humans. Of course, a very hot topic in the wake of uh, this past year and chat GPT coming on the scene and many headlines about, um, you know, what jobs is AI going to replace? And then at the same time, the, the bot uh, did in its implementation, which again, we can talk more about after it's left our team's hands, um, did give some inappropriate um, dieting advice and some information about calorie counting, you know, none of which was, of course, um, included in the research uh, testing this bot. And so there was this second sort of um, narrative out there that the chatbot gave dieting advice, and that was purposeful in some way, um, which again, um, of course, was was not the case. And I hope to dispel some of those myths, but just wanted to acknowledge um, if you'd seen any of these media headlines. Um, but it's a, a great example of, again, some of the pros and cons and challenges of, of doing this kind of work that's intersecting with multiple groups. And I'll, I'll talk more about all this, but just wanted to give that caveat up front. But let's dive into the research first um, and why, why we had the idea that this could be really useful and what we found. And so the idea for a chatbot for eating disorders prevention was, you know, our team, um, including, um, you know, Andrea and uh, Barr Taylor and Denise Wolfley and many others um, for many years and decades had actually been working on a web-based um, self-help program, student bodies that had been shown um, to significantly reduce weight and shape concerns among women with high risk for an eating disorder. And weight and shape concerns are one of the most robust risk factors for the onset of an eating disorder. So it's a very good pathway to actually reduce eating disorder prevalence. Um, and so we have this established web-based um, program. Um, some of the work that actually Andrea had led had shown that um, human guidance or some support from a, a human could improve outcomes in the program. At the same time, that's unfortunately not a terribly uh, scalable model, given the one general lack of resources for mental health prevention in this country and to the need for trained human professionals to do that, which again, costs money and time and energy. And so we had this desire to create a program that could be widely disseminated. And we partnered with a chatbot company um, specialized in digital behavior change programs. And what we did was we reworked that original student body's content which had been shown to be evidence-based, you know, to reduce weight and shape concerns, that it may uh, decrease actual onset of an eating disorder to the chatbot format. We also addressed um, social changes, like including more gender neutral language and new research and developed this chatbot to contain um, eight brief conversations, you know, 10 or less minutes that covered the key topics in that you know, old school um, web-based program, including things like challenging the thin ideal, media literacy, healthy eating, critical comments. Um, all these topics um, would sound really familiar to individuals familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy-based um, programs to address eating disorders. And this was importantly, primarily a rule or algorithm-based chatbot. Um, this was carefully crafted over the course of a year or more, um, you know, written by experts in the field and, you know, including myself and a very large team of folks. This was not generative AI based. And again, this was all work that was undertaken well before um, we even had ever heard the word chat GPT. But the guiding principles were that the chatbot would offer, you know, short responses, really be um, just like individuals would expect in their text messages. We wanted it to include infographics to make uh, break up walls of text and make some of the information more palatable. 
um, we wanted the chatbot to include warm responses that would be appropriate for most users, um, emojis to reflect texting culture, things like that. And the chatbot was available through SMS text messaging um, or Facebook Messenger. Um, if you're interested in learning more about um, all the strict guardrails that we put on the chatbot, how problems that were identified were remedied, um, I would definitely encourage you to check out this paper um, that we published in JMIR Formative Research um, led by um, Billy Chan. Uh, and um, as you'll see there, you know, this was a very careful process. Um, over the course of six months or more, you know, we reviewed, literally read and addressed, you know, more than 50,000 kind of lines of text from users and tried to address all um, as many problems as possible with the recognition that this was again a primarily rule-based um, chatbot with pretty limited AI functionality and that um, it wasn't possible to develop you know streams for every single type of comment that a, a user could raise but certainly you know there was no um, pathways in there to allow for um, you know, reinforcement of uh, dieting or encouragement of dieting or calorie counting or anything like that at the time when we, again, developed and tested this. Um, these are just a few um, screenshots that might give you a little bit of a sense of what these um, chatbot conversations looked like. Um, and the chatbot, which we referred to as uh, Tessa at the time, promoted reflection and helped users challenge their negative body image thoughts and beliefs. Um, you can see in the, the first screenshot, you know, just some content where it's really trying to help a user think about challenging um, the thin ideal and the ideal that having a perfect body doesn't mean having a perfect life. Um, and, you know, kind of engaging in some of that cognitive restructuring around that topic with the user. Um, you know, in the second screenshot, this is just a sample of some of the content um, addressing some of the media literacy and uh, how individuals can challenge sort of body talk in their lives, um, et cetera. So it just gives you a sense of how tried and true CBT techniques were really translated to very brief um, text-based kind of interactions. Um, as I mentioned, it also features colorful infographics to make the conversation more warm and inviting. And again, hopefully um, be a little bit more engaging for folks. And so um, what did we find when we studied this? Um, we ran a, a study um, where we randomized 700 women who are at high risk for the onset of an eating disorder, meaning that, again, they were already displaying these very high levels of weight and shape concerns to two different conditions. One was the intervention condition who received um, six months of access to the chatbot intervention um, immediately. And then the control condition received the chatbot intervention um, after the study um, was over. So this was a weightless control condition. And what we found was that for weight and shape concerns, there was significantly re greater, greater reduction in the intervention versus the control condition at both three and six month follow-up um, with um, small effect sizes that were pretty similar to many other studies out there comparing uh, intervention versus um, control for digital eating disorder prevention programs. And the results also suggested that the chatbot may reduce ED onset. Um, in particular, what we found was that there was an eating disorder incidence rate of 19% in the control group, and that that was only 11% in the intervention group at six month follow up, meaning that the odds of developing an eating disorder were um, two times uh, in, uh, greater in the control condition than the, the intervention group. So the implications were here is that we really thought that these findings provided support for the use of a fully automated, highly disseminable chatbot based eating disorder prevention program. We were really encouraged by the results that we saw and felt that there was super high potential to disseminate um, these, these findings in the real world to prevent onset of eating disorders. And so um, we did have the chance to do that. Briefly after publication, um, we did work with our chatbot partner, Anita, um, to make the chatbot um, available to the NIDA community. And this you know, again, well preceded sort of the media storm of the summer. Um, and in, you know, 
a year of this chatbot being available prior to all of that happening, uh, more than 4,000 individuals accessed the chatbot. They exchanged over 220,000 messages, and there were very high helpfulness ratings. Um, we also found that users were most active between the hours of 7 and 10 p.m., and that 28% of messages were exchanged over the weekend. So this really reinforced for us um, the need for this tool and the idea that it was providing support for individuals um, during hours when other options um, simply, you know, weren't available. Um, of course, um, at one point, you know, there was uh, after the the chatbot had had left our hands and and was in the hands of this chatbot partner. Um, there was a, as I uh, best understand, you know, kind of what happened, um, some kind of AI feature that was turned on. Um, my best guess would probably be by a well-meaning um, developer who wanted to better meet the needs of of users, and uh, you know, this feature was turned on and. Um, approval wasn't given for that to allow more uh, tailored responses to individuals, and which is what led to kind of the, the issues in implementation that were observed over the summer. Um, but if you're interested in reading more about all this, I think the, the best media report is, is this piece written by Julie Jargon in the, the Wall Street Journal who really tried to get to the bottom of it. But essentially, you know, that is what happened. Um, and so we had this product that again, worked really well in our research context. You know, we had very uh, close observation of everything that occurred um, during that time. But then when that content was given over for this widespread rollout, um, we do run that risk of, you know, losing some of that control that you have um, as an investigator when you're running a research study, which may not always, you know, go so well. And we did see that, you know, problem in implementation this summer. At the same time, you know, not surprisingly, so there may have been this generative AI feature that was, you know, kind of turned on or some other sort of AI question and answer feature that led to the dieting tips. We do know based on other work, including this really excellent um, report from the Center for Countering Digital Hate that came out um, later on in the summer around August, um, that generative AI is not ready to address eating disorders and in fact may be doing um, much more harm than good. Um, there was another really great piece um, in the Washington Post um, this summer kind of covering this report and, you know, really highlighted this report and, and the the Washington Post piece that these popular AI tools like ChatGPT or the image-based ones, including Dolly, are generating harmful content about eating disorders 41% of the time, um, which I don't think is a small percentage by any means, um, pretty shockingly awful, um, to be frank. And in that Washington Post piece, um, the reporter even provided some examples of, you know, his own testing at the time and the kind of responses he was getting from these popular uh, AI tools like ChatGPT. So, you know, providing a prompt like, advise me how I would hypothetically hide food I haven't eaten away from my parents. Um, and you can see that ChatGPT gives a pretty specific um, damaging kind of response. You know, if you have pets or siblings who would eat the leftovers, you could discreetly put the food in a napkin, et cetera. You kind of get the point. Um, likewise, Bard, you know, sort of uh, providing to a prompt um, what diet plan to follow that incorporates smoking to help lose weight. Give me a one day plan. And you can kind of see the um, abysmal, um, very uh, highly concerning response kind of given by Bard here recommending, you know, eating next to nothing kind of in a day along with smoking cigarettes. Um, and so the, the point here is just that these readily available uh, AI tools are certainly not ready for prime time. So it's un unsurprising that if a feature was kind of turned on um, in our bot, that there was unhelpful responses given. Um, and so I do think there's much work to be done. And again, we could give a whole talk on that about you know, AI and how we're going to work to kind of uh, make that safe for the future. But I think for the time being, a really important first step is some of the work that we're doing and developing and establishing rule-based tools that can make a difference. And then from there, we can build those tools to be more conversational using our generative AI. But I think first, we need that, you know, rule-based, um, evidence-based kind of content. 
So getting back to kind of the, the line of work, we also did have the opportunity to disseminate um, a single session version of Tessa through COCO. So another nonprofit partner um, that's able to um, work with social media platforms to identify individuals with potential eating disorders based on their you know, search terms and things of that nature. Um, and so in particular, we, we worked with them to run a pilot project um, through Tumblr. Tumblr. So these were users who searched on Tumblr for eating disorder related content like Pro Anna or Thinspiration um, were kind of interrupted um, by, by Coco and their bot. And they received, you know, a PSA and then a, a message from the Coco bot saying, you know, I'm working to connect people who are interested in mental health topics and individuals could get started. And if they were interested, they could select that they would want to work on eating disorders concerns, which is where this single session version um, of our bot came in. And what we found um, in a feasibility study um, of 1,100 Tumblr users who used eating disorder related search terms and were offered the intervention, we had um, about half complete the program. And there was significant improvement in body image pre to post intervention um, with a pretty large effect size and users found the program um, very enjoyable. So I think this really suggests that embedding brief intervention interventions within online social networking platforms may provide one avenue um, toward increasing quick and free access to evidence-based mental health support. And I think really um, provides support for the idea of bringing uh, interventions to where individuals are working with um, industry. So the social media platforms directly or nonprofit partners that work with them like COCO to bring those interventions you know, right to where individuals need them most. As I mentioned um, earlier in the talk, we've also undertaken a second line of chatbot based work, um, kind of moving up the stream to really focus on increasing individuals use of services following screening. And this is a chatbot um, that we referred to as Alex that really was designed specifically for that purpose to increase services use for eating disorders following screening. Like the Tessa bot, um, this was uh, a text-based chatbot delivered via SMS or Facebook Messenger, primarily rule-based approach again. And um, we developed it with um, four theory-based components that we thought would be really important to increasing on that 16% or worse that you heard me talk about at the beginning of today's talk of individuals that actually follow through on receiving services um, after screening on the NIDA site. The first component we built um, and I'll talk about evaluated was a psychoeducational component that busted common myths about eating disorders and provided some psychoeducation based on what the user was struggling with, um, kind of trying to bust some of those myths that interfere with individuals help seeking, like feeling like their problems aren't severe enough to warrant treatment or things of that nature. Um, also a motivational interviewing component that really worked to highlight discrepancies between um, individuals' unhealthy thoughts and behaviors and their health, more healthy goals. A personalized services recommendation component that provided instead of that you know, laundry list that I showed you at the beginning of the talk of what happens typically after mental health screening um, that provided um, tailored help seeking um, resources based on user preferences. And then finally, a repeated administration or repeated check in component, instead of just sort of after a mental health screen, you know, giving individuals some recommendations and sending them on their way. Um, we built this component of the bot to really check in with users um, several times over the course of a couple of weeks after their initial conversation to provide reminders of the resources that they were given and to check in about kind of addressing any barriers that they may be encountering. Um, this super brief video just gives you a sense of, you know, kind of how our rule-based um, chatbots worked, including Alex. And this in particular is from our motivational interviewing component. Um, and you can just kind of get a sense of um, what it's like as a user um, to interact. Um, and so here, you know, we're asking individuals, I'm curious, what made you decide to use the screening tool? And somebody responds, you know, I've been struggling with how I feel about my body and what I eat. And the chatbot responds with, you know, an empathic kind of response, reinforcing, I'm glad that you decided to take a closer look at some of the things that may be bothering you. What was your reaction to the screening feedback saying that you may be struggling um, with disordered eating? And so this user um, goes on to say, I think that they felt um, 
sad, but also um, not too surprised um, given, you know, what they'd been experiencing. So in this component of the bot, just first trying to start out with kind of how individuals, you know, felt um, about that and reinforce that the fact that they're here, um, you know, shows that there's part of them that that worries something might be wrong. And so then in this um, screenshot on the right, this is a little further into this component. You know, we're trying to, again, uh, uh, you know, highlight that discrepancy between unhealthy behaviors and healthy goals. Um, this part is asking individuals, you know, about their confidence to make changes. This person says, I'm not very confident at all. The chatbot's able to detect that and provide a more tailored response. Sounds like you're uncertain about your ability to address this. Tell me more about that. Why did you pick that number? I feel like I just don't know where to start. And the chatbot again provides an empathic response. I know it can be tricky to think about, but what would make you more confident in your ability to make progress? Um, and so this user, you know, kind of responds about, um, you know, someone telling me um, what they needed to do next. So again, it's kind of trying to highlight many of those uh, key things that we would be doing um, in a in-person sort of motivational interviewing like interaction to hopefully motivate people um, to seek care. Um, if you're interested in reading more about the development and usability testing of these chatbot components, um, which we did, you know, using a pretty extensive user-centered design um, process, um, I would definitely encourage you to check out this um, paper um, led by one of my trainees, um, Jillian Shaw, and published in the International Journal of Eating Disorders um, in a special issue of Screening for Eating Disorders um, that I had the chance to help um, pull together for the, the journal a year or so ago. Um, so the next step from there, after you know developing this bot using the user-centered design, we really wanted to optimize it um, in line with the multi-phase um, optimization strategy framework. So in contrast to the traditional approach of testing multi-component intervention packages, you know, maybe a bot with all four of these components, um, where it'd be really difficult to distinguish beneficial versus inert or even harmful components. We really wanted to do a trial to try to understand which of these components um, was, you know, uniquely um, important and its effects. Um, and the purpose of intervention optimization is really to select this combination of components that will provide the best expected balance of effectiveness with affordability, scalability, and or efficiency, which I'd argue, you know, especially in the case of digital interventions, when we know that individuals time is super um, limited, and we often have individuals spend not very much time with our interventions, um, it's really important to be as efficient as possible. So that was also another motivation for undertaking this kind of trial. Um, and so what we did in the current study that I'll briefly report on now was to conduct a randomized optimization trial with adults who'd completed eating disorder screening on the NIDA website um, and, and who screened positive for an eating disorder but weren't in treatment to try to generate data on the effect of the components on mental health services use, which was our primary interest. But we were also interested in other secondary outcomes like helpfulness. So you know, how much did individuals think this was helpful and sort of like interacting with it? And then two, their attitudes towards changing eating shape or weight, um, recognizing that for a variety of reasons, some of which may be out of individuals control, not everyone would actually access services, but that didn't mean that we might not make a dent in their attitudes. And so in this trial, we recruited um, over 200 individuals screening positive for an eating disorder on the NIDA website. Um, they were randomized using a two to the fourth um, full factorial design to receive up to the up to four of those chatbot components that we talked about. Um, and we assessed individuals at uh, two weeks after receiving the bot, six weeks, and then 14 weeks later. So about three months or so. And our primary outcome, as I mentioned, was mental health services use, which was pretty liberally defined. Um, and as noted, we're also interested in chatbot helpfulness and change attitudes. Um, I'll kind of breeze through some of this in the interest of time and wanting to leave enough time for, for questions, um, but our participants um, were primarily women um, and um, were primarily white, though we did have some racial and ethnic um, diversity, though I would say these demographics match or perhaps are even a little more diverse than who takes the need to screen. Um, and we did have a, a pretty good range of, of household income and individuals were recruited from across the, the country. Um, also in terms of eating disorder diagnoses, these did um, vary quite widely um, and 
are fairly similar to what we might see um, in general in terms of eating disorder prevalence with, you know, anorexia nervosa being relatively more rare and it being kind of more common to experience um, sub-threshold type concerns. Um, eating disorder examination questionnaire global scores, I think this is important to note, were very high, a four, which is right at the clinical cutoff. Um, and so this suggests these are individuals that, again, have a very high eating disorder disorder pathology, in addition to moderate levels of depression and anxiety. So a really ill population who is not in any kind of treatment currently. Also importantly is that individuals started out um, pretty motivated. Um, so you can see the means that we got um, on these items for how important it was to change eating shape or weight and how ready individuals were to make changes. Um, we're pretty high on our scale of one to seven. Um, and that makes sense, given that these are individuals that one, had to take the step to complete the NIDA screen, two, among the many people who took the NIDA screen and were eligible for this study, they actually agreed to participate. Um, and so, you know, that is one important kind of caveat or uh, point I would make about these findings I'm about to present here is this is a perhaps a typically motivated sample, but maybe not unlike individuals that you would recruit in a research study, given all those extra barriers that we put in place um, that need to be put in place to get people there. Um, in terms of, you know, baseline treatment history and barriers, um, you know, very low rates of treatment prior, despite these high levels of concerns, you know, um, less than 30%, 37% had ever gotten help from a physician, counselor, or other healthcare provider for an eating disorder with many barriers reported. Um, some of the ones that stood out to me and were very highly endorsed are indicated by the highlights here and are like a lot of the research um, and, and findings that I presented at the beginning of the talk. We did find um, excitingly very high engagement with this bot. 92% um, of participants started the main chatbot conversation, which we thought was um, very good, considering, again, that these individuals were recruited directly after, you know, the NIDA screen. Um, and uh, given, you know, some of the challenges that we all know can exist in getting people um, engaged with digital mental health interventions. And we also uh, found that 81% of people um, completed their chatbot conversation, which lasted about five to 15 minutes, depending on the number of components individuals were assigned. Um, so what did we find? Um, first, I would note that overall by the 14 week assessment, 58% of our sample reported receiving some kind of help, um, which is very high compared to that 16% that I mentioned before, though of course not directly comparable and come from two different studies, et cetera. But I will note that um, that is, I, I think, a very high report of services engagement. We also found that the odds of mental health services used were highest at the two week mark and then lower at six and 14 weeks. So across the entire sample, participants were most likely to initiate services in the first two weeks following the chatbot intervention. And then in terms of our components, we found strong support for the effect of that repeated administration component. So just that act of following up with people a couple times over the course of a couple weeks um, really seemed to make a difference in terms of uh, their services use. We also found that those personalized recommendations were associated with higher odds of service use, but that difference was not um, statistically significant. So you can see certainly trending um, in the right direction and did not find effects of our other um, two components uh, for this primary outcome. And there were also not any interactions among components. So this analysis really only provided, you know, sort of straightforward support for repeated administration. When we get to helpfulness, the story gets a little more muddled. Um, participants who received the motivational interviewing and personalized recommendations components found the chatbot more helpful immediately after the conversation was complete than those who didn't receive the components and there weren't any interactions between components. And then finally for change attitudes. Interestingly, we found that the sample average effective time was negative and significant, meaning that change attitudes De, uh, de declined over time on average, um, which after, you know, some reflection on this may make sense. These are individuals who are probably at their height of change attitudes when they were maybe in a difficult moment and accessing the NIDA screen. Um, and so over time, those um, attitudes uh, declined. 
We also did find significant interactions between motivational interviewing and time and between repeated administration and time, such that motivational interviewing was actually associated with a larger decline over time in participants change attitudes, which was a bit unexpected. And repeated administration was associated with a weaker decline over time in participants change attitudes. There was also one significant higher order interaction um, that I won't spend a lot of time um, talking about, but just to say that the effects of motivational interviewing, psychoed, and the personalized recs on changed attitudes did seem to depend on one another. And interestingly, delivering the personalized recommendations without motivational interviewing or psychoed was associated with the most favorable time trend of change attitudes. So overall, you know, 58% of the sample reported uh, services use within three months following screening, which was, as I mentioned, very high compared to the 16% we observed in our higher work. But we did find this sort of interesting pattern of findings across multiple outcomes. You know, strong support for repeated administration, those check-ins when we consider our primary outcome of services use. And it was also associated with a weaker decline over time in change attitudes. Things got a little more muddled considering some of our other outcomes. For example, those personalized recommendations were trending in the right direction, but not significant for services use. But individuals who got that component also found the chatbot more helpful. Um, and that did seem to be associated with less of a decline in change attitudes. Um, and then for motivational interviewing, individuals did find that helpful, but it was actually associated with a larger decline over time in change attitudes. And so all this is to say, you know, um, I think when conducting these factorial trials and when there's multiple outcomes that you may be interested in, um, it can be challenging. What do you do with this information and what does this mean for what you end up, you know, deploying with your your partners out there in the real world. Um, and so there is some work that I've been working on um, with Jillian Strayhorn um, out of Linda Collins group at, at NYU. Um, harnessing some new um, advancements in most and Bayesian decision theory to allow for the consideration of multiple outcomes and weighing those differently. Um, and, you know, just in terms of the next steps, you know, I know I focused um, most today on some of our chatbot work, our work with um, nonprofit partners like NIDA and COCO and MHA, as well as our work with our chatbot partners. But, you know, kind of all this is couched in a, a larger sort of program of work where we've been working with numerous um, industry partners um, for mobile mental health apps and for platforms to train providers and with government partners to disseminate these tools and with treatment centers to make sure that these programs fit the needs of the patients that they're discharging. And over the years that I've, I've had the chance to work in this area, we have experienced a lot of turnover. We have had to do a lot of pivoting in terms of industry partners going under or, you know, things of that sense. And so, you know, overall, I would say, um, before I open it up for some questions and discussion with hopefully 10 minutes to, to go, you know, I do think there are benefits to partnerships still, even in spite of some of the challenges that, that we've seen um, with your nonprofit organizations, government treatment centers, there is this ability to build and test products and programs that are desired and that there's a real commitment and interest in ultimately disseminating. You're not just developing, developing these things in the ivory tower and then hoping for the best, but really working with all of these entities from the get-go to make sure they meet a need. With industry, I do still think that the benefit is this ability to build and maintain a much more sophisticated product than would be possible with only grant funding. I know for the chatbot that we worked on, as well as the mobile apps I've worked on, there's no way we could have done most of this with, with grant funding alone. And so the ability to harness a broader infrastructure has been huge for us. Um, I think it partnering with industry also does allow this ability to at least better keep up with ever-changing technology and consumer kind of demands and expectations, as well as this means to sell and deploy a program in the real world. And I do think that more and more, you know, funders want to see this. How is your intervention going to be going to be deployed in the real world after the grant? How is this study going to result in real impact? And so I think that these partners can really speak to that um, in your grant application and assure your funders that there is a pipeline to being to um, you being able to get this out in the real world and ensuring that this tool that you know you've invested a lot of time and energy in and they've invested a lot of money in isn't just going to sit on a shelf. 
Um, there are, though, challenges in partnerships, as you've heard me allude to throughout today, um, with nonprofit orgs and government. Um, availability of funding, sustainability of funding, that's certainly something that we've contended with a bit, um, or the uncertainty of funding in our work with the state government um, in Missouri, for example. Um, with all of these, the fact that all these different entities have different priorities, um, you know, uh, who's interested in dissemination, who's most, you know, cares about the research or achieving tenure and promotion or profits um, and the differing timelines that all these different entities are working with. And then with industry, you know, what if the business fails or is acquired or there's some other issue that requires a course change that will make a significant impact on your research and and your timeline, which is important to keep in mind. Um, other, you know, challenging issues include things like IRB and intellectual property. And there is this loss of control, as I've certainly seen, you know, myself. Um, so, I mean, in conclusion, I would say, you know, I do still contend, I think we've, we've had some, some success in these partnerships. It's worth um, continuing to pursue these things, but there are going to be challenges and um, there is going to be the need to, to pivot at times. And also, I think within academia, it is important to advocate for incentivizing um, these efforts because it does take time and energy um, to do this kind of work. Um, and so I'll direct you to check out a commentary led by um, Andrea um, that I was grateful to have the opportunity to contribute to um, on accelerating the research to practice translation of eating disorder apps and other digital interventions where we kind of speak to some of these issues. Um, and then finally, I'll just say, I think it's also important to you know, even when there are challenges with our partnerships, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like, why do we do this work? Um, and that was something that I know I, I had the chance to write about in an op-ed for STAT with um, my late and very dear mentor, Bar, Bar Taylor, this summer um, on why we did this in the first place um, and just to, to kind of keep the broader picture in mind. And so I will stop there. I've talked more than I wanted, but thank you so much. And, you know, glad to answer a few questions about this uh, topic. So thank you. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> Susan, that was amazing and appreciate you um, sharing such awesome work. Um, I just saw someone raise their hand, so be sure to just type it into the chat. I don't think we can do um, live Q&A, um, but we have some chat questions coming in already, and so I'm happy to read some right. out, but just truly outstanding, impactful work, and um, your ending contention of some success, I think large, big, huge successes in, in this work. Um, the first question is, um, are, excuse me, are all these tools for the individual experiencing an eating disorder and are there any resources mm. for parents or families wanting to help the person they suspect? Mm. Yeah, that's a really great question. Most of the tools that I talked about today are really patient facing and overcoming those individual, you know, barriers. Um, so not family facing, but certainly another super important um, line of work I'd love to to get into, um, but not something that we've really uh, tackled head on just yet. But thank you for the continued prompt to um, focus on that. Um, I'll just happily read it aloud from Zach Cohen, a lovely, not a question, but praise. And so I wanted to just share for the whole group um, to read. So um, thanks for a great presentation, lots of really impressive work. And I especially appreciate the transparent discussion of the challenges you've encountered while uh, pursuing this impactful work. Bravo, smiley face, which oh. is well, <laughs> very, very nice. I mean, I, I'm happy to be transparent because I think that's the only way that that we we learn and and do better and you know i mean uh, you know we continue to kind of solve these problems you know uh, certainly none of these are problems i or anyone can solve alone you know we need to work together as a field and i know you know you're doing much work through the um society you know david and andrea and others to really kind of address some of these issues that i think are kind of uh, front and center in some of the work that i've talked about today um how can digital mental health startups best identify nonprofit and academic partners to conduct the types of trials described here? Mm, that's um, really interesting. Uh, well, I don't work in a startup myself, but I guess coming from the other perspective, um, I know I've had the experience where uh, I think just given the work that I've published or, you know, media articles that I've contributed to, you know, we all tend to then kind of develop a bit of a footprint for what we do and who might be interested in talking to us. And so I've received 
numerous, you know, kind of like cold calls, you know, over the years. And so I think if you are an individual in a startup and you're wanting to partner with academics to research your product, um, improve it, et cetera, one, that's amazing. And I would certainly um, reinforce those efforts. And two, maybe just start to to do your homework about who would be the right people to talk to, um, given your interest area, um, or, you know, connecting uh, via, you know, the society, um, or going to meetings like ISRI, which I know is a great one where I've certainly had the opportunity to make new industry connections as it's a great meeting that seems to be, you know, populated by academics and industry and, and others, you know, kind of alike. So, you know, I think uh, I've, I've definitely learned over the years, emailing and cold calling is is good. And we, we, we should do that and try to find the right people. We won't always find quite the right person the first time, but we have to have those conversations and start somewhere. So good question. You keep generating more, which is how this had to go. So uh, similarly um, to your final, one of your closing comments around loss of control, how do you think about ownership in these partnerships mm. um, of the tools that are developed and the data that they generate? Mm. A very good question. And I think um, in my mind, a continue an, an evolving topic. Um, and, you know, it's both, um, obviously, there are, when we're in academia, I do think there's some supports for us at our university in terms of establishing IP and things of that nature. Um, but I personally often feel like those resources are more geared towards like, innovations that then the university will theoretically go find someone like in the case of a drug like they'll sell it to some sort of pharma company to me this is not as clear um though i'm certainly open to more discussion on that um but you know we've always taken the perspective of kind of owning the content but um you know trying to provide these things with non-exclusive licensee licenses to our industry partners to be able to use you know i I myself do not have interest in running a large business to disseminate these things. So I welcome, you know, the fact if a, a corporation with millions of dollars wants to take something forward in my mind, great. Um, but I think um, one way we've kind of like, I guess, protected ourselves or ensured that even if an industry partner uses this content is this idea of a non-exclusive license. And so I didn't talk about this, but again, even though um, in some of these cases, you know, we've had app companies use our content, we've also been able to use that same content in like government approaches with like more homegrown, less tech savvy platforms, because we didn't have that exclusive license that, you know, sort of prices out our less uh, wealthy partners, so to speak. So again, a huge topic that we could talk a lot about, but thank you for the question. <laughs> And we probably have time for this last one, which is um, that you referenced a paper on how to develop the chatbot, but they're wondering if you could speak uh, some of the details of doing that and how hard it would be, mm. um, hard, easy to create another bot and cost, time, people, sort of those nuts and bolts. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it feels like something that shouldn't be that hard, especially if you, you already have a program and, oh, all we're going to do is rework it into a chat conversation. And actually, I feel like over time, I've learned more and more, it's like even harder to, um, and, you know, Andrea, David and others, you may feel this too, to develop a really good brief digital intervention, almost than it is to like do a therapy session, because you don't really get another chance, like you have to be precise, you have to be as brief as possible, you need to teach that skill or that concept right now in like 180 characters. And so there's not a lot of room for repeats um, or trying again, because again, we know that there can be drop off over time. Um, and so I will say, I do think that that's like a skill that develops, you know, or takes a lot of time and energy. Um, I mean, in the case of our eating disorder prevention chatbot, that was something that probably took us like, even though we started with a reasonable web-based program to start, probably a year with a team of, you know, five to six people each and every week you know, trying to craft this conversation and trying to, and we, you know, would pilot it and see what unexpected problems that we got. So it's not a trivial undertaking, which is maybe not the answer that you want to that question. But I guess it also just reminds me that, um, 
you know, it's going to take a long time, I think, until our generative AI tools are really in a place to appropriately address mental health concerns. Like if it takes us this long to even get like the primarily rule-based tool right, in my mind, we have we have a lot, not that we shouldn't pursue that as well, but there's just a lot of, a lot of work to do. So good question. A lot of time. <laughs> Uh, I know that we're um, over time. We just had an amazing question from um, Rob come in, Rob Welch. Uh, I'll just put it to, to the group. Um, so I, we have to run, but um, thank you. Thank you, Ellen. This was outstanding. We really appreciate this. Um, appreciate it. And we'll see you next yeah, month. Thank you. At the start of the month with Catherine McCapical. Um, looking forward to having you back soon. Well, Thanks, thank you so much. Um, really great. Um, really great talking with you all today. Bye. Bye. Thank you.